Hallelujah. Good to be here once again. Three weeks in a row, people keep coming back. I want to uh, congratulate you guys on being such a good church. You know, not every church, the pastor can go away for three or four weeks at a time uh, like this and, and have people continue to come. And that really is, um, that's a sad thing, but I really appreciate that you guys don't seem to think like that. You know, we, we, we know in this church that we are the church, don't we? So whether we, wherever we and whenever we gather together, Jesus is in the midst of us. And uh, I know that's a great uh, blessing to, to have that uh, knowledge for Pastor Neil and Nan. So anyway, we've, we've been so blessed to be here. And uh, it's always just, you know, it's, it's relaxing. It's easier to pastor someone else's church. That's what I tell people. So we've been coming here. We, we've been speaking on Sundays, but we've also been traveling around to the different meetings you do and, and, at different ones and, and uh, enjoying the, the different folks here. So uh, we think that you guys are family, so we always come here and, and really have a good time. It's a getaway for us. And um, we appreciate the offering and everything, but we would come and do it for absolutely nothing. It's uh, Neil that demands to, to try to bless us every time, but we come to be around him because to be around him and Nancy is a, a great blessing for us, and to be with all of you guys is a great blessing for us. And um, because they're our spiritual parents, then it's even, it's even that much greater. Amen? Because there's something to be gotten. Don't ever forget this about, about your pastor or those that God puts you under. Is there is something there that they can give to you and impart to you in the name of Jesus. So just by being around them and just by the kind of attitude that we display around, not, you know, each other too, to a degree, but, but especially those, like the verse said there, especially those of the household of faith, there's a special blessing in that. And uh, so I tell you, we would fly all the way across the world like this, not only to enjoy, enjoy Australia, but to come and to be around Neil and Nan and just to soak up that which God put them in our life for. There are things that, at my age, I'm an older guy now, but there are things that Neil has, for example, ministry-wise, that I still need to draw from. There's wisdom, there's anointing, there's influence, there's just so many certain kinds of things that, and many things that he wouldn't even know that he's done. And uh, so to come here and to be around that is a great blessing. And I want to encourage you guys as believers and members of this church, don't be afraid to get something here. Give your all, and in giving your all, get something of the spirit and the life and the atmosphere that's in this place, amen? Because uh, it, it'll be a great blessing to you. You may not ever realize it until you need to realize it. And on that moment, on that day or whatever, then you'll know, thank God that I did what God called me to do. We're living in a day today where, uh, you know, I don't think we can stress this enough. There's a great battle going on in the world today. It's very evident if you're, you know, uh, paying attention, if you're, you've been watching the news and that kind of thing, I mean, you know, there's a battle going on today. Things are quickly shifting and changing. And so these things that we're preaching here, I know the things that I've been presenting to you over the last few weeks, they're super important because they will challenge you. But they will also equip you and help you to become aware, to think about, all right, let's keep our mind on the things of God. The Bible says, God says, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee or on me talking about himself, amen? So if there's ever been an hour when we need to keep our minds focused and keep on track with God, today is that day. And uh, so everything that I've been talking to you about is, is uh, really purposefully meant to help you run your race. There are many different callings in this room. There are many different giftings in this room and across the body of Christ. You need to be free to be the, the you that God made you to be, but in order to do that, you're going to have to let God be free to be himself in your life. Amen? And so we've been talking about over the past few weeks the city of God. And I want you to grab your Bible with me this morning. Open it up, if you would, to the book of Psalms. And we're going to just continue in that vein. The city of God. Go to Psalm 133. The 133rd Psalm. We'll continue talking about something that we've uh, been mentioning to you over these past few weeks about the city of God. Again, I have notes here. I may or may not use them. Don't hold it against me either way. Are you glad you came to church this morning? I notice this pulpit has wheels, so we'll roll it out here a little bit. Does it roll sideways? Yes, it does. It's kind of like your shopping carts you have in the shopping centers here. Our shopping carts in America don't roll sideways, but I, I love the fact that yours do. They're much more dynamic that way. <laughs> 
Bobby gets mad at me because when we're shopping here, I sometimes do a 360 with the cart just because I can. It's fun. I haven't grown out of that part of my, you know, I haven't, haven't overcome that part of my maturity level yet. But your pulpits do the same thing. What an amazing thing. For preachers like me, this can be very handy. Did you find your place in Psalm 133? Don't be afraid to say amen in this church. I think sometimes Christians don't realize we've, we've been taught kind of, you know, we've, we've grown up in a certain culture and the generation that we've grown up in, and we don't realize that, you know, preaching is not a, it's not a one-way thing. It's not, this is not a lecture. We're actually doing the same thing we were doing in the worship. We're just simply interacting with God. Amen? And so we help each other along the way. And so you have a part in this sermon as well as me. I have to preach the thing that God gave me or talk about the thing that God gave me, but you have to absorb. You have to help me create an atmosphere of faith and receptivity to the Lord. And when we do that, it's, then it gets beyond any of us. You can't go away and say, oh, that, that preacher preached a great sermon or anything like that because we just, you know, we just made ourselves available to the Lord and he does what he always does. He just comes and he works and he moves and he blesses, Amen. And so don't be afraid to, to get involved a little bit. You don't have to be like me. You don't have to be boisterous or anything. But get your focus on this morning. Let's really look into the Word of God and then just help me along the way to kind of feel out the direction and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 133 might be a very familiar psalm to you. It says this. It's just three small verses. But it says before you even get to verse 1 in my Bible, it says this is a song of ascents. Can you say ascents? Uh, talking about ascending. It's a song of ascending. It's a song that David wrote. David, David was maybe the best illustrative person in the Old Testament, or one of the best anyway, of what it means to ascend. This particular psalm was written so that pilgrims in the nation of Israel who did not live in Jerusalem, when they went back to Jerusalem to attend the seven feasts every year, as they were ascending, and if you know anything about Jerusalem, if you've been there, you know it's up on a hill, right? And so it's uh, very visible from a ways away. So even if you're coming from the north, you usually have to go down in elevation and then ascend back up as you go up into the city. One of my favorite things about Jerusalem is that just you have to drive up to it. And, and then it's just like this fortress up on a hill. And, and so this psalm and other psalms uh, in the book of Psalm, Psalms were written as the pilgrims, as the believers were ascending as they were going, in some ways, like us going to church. As you're going to celebrate the feast that the Lord asked you to celebrate, as you are going to keep the calendar of the Lord, then go in joy, go in faith, go with God. Remind yourself along the way. Be aware of what you're doing. Go up so that before you ever get there, you've already connected with the Lord. And if you do that, when you get there, your time there is going to be, you know, much more fruitful much more well spent. Sometimes what happens is we go to church and we forget to engage ourselves. We forget to engage our feelings and then we go away and we're like, well, I don't know if anything happened or not, but it's only because you, you didn't feel it. Somebody else might have felt it. It may, not have, it may not have registered on their face. They may not have been dancing around the church or anything like that, but they may have got something just because that on their way to church or Throughout the week as they were thinking about the call of God on their life and the other people that they're mixed with in this particular area, you know, and God's building a church around, as they were thinking about that and working with the Lord in that, then the Lord began to stir them up. And a lot of people today like to talk about revival, and we're always looking for revival. And it's, it's interesting because revival's been this thing that's been hard to grasp in my lifetime. We had these great revivals in history, but then all of a sudden you come back to around the, the 60s and 70s as the charismatic movement began to wane, you know, and there hasn't been any real earth-shaking worldwide real revivals. I mean, there's been some little pieces of revival. We may or may not be in agreement on that, but I'm talking about real change everything, moves of God. And so... A lot of Christians, you know, we're always looking for revival, but we forget that, you know, revival's not something you go get. Revival is something that we have. Revival is something that we are. Wherever two or three of us are gathered together in the name of Jesus, there he is. So there is revival. Wherever his presence is, there is the movement of the water. There is the movement of the air current. Hello? And so we shouldn't we shouldn't, as Christians, be painting a picture that we're always looking for something or we're always waiting for something. I mean, we should be something. 
Because in God, we are something. And it seems a little bit crazy. Put yourself back outside of Christian shoes, you know. Go back out into the world and look back into Christianity and think, seems a little bit weird that they're always after something but not really are ever securing anything. A little quiet in this Australian church this morning. Huh? You see, a lot of us miss a lot of things because we're, we're used to living according to the, the, the really the worldly saying that perception is reality. You know, we've been taught that so much. Business leaders teach us that. You go to church and some leader there teaches that. Perception is reality, but perception is not reality. Perception may become your reality, but it's not really reality. It's the truth that's reality. You shall know the truth, the Bible says, and the truth shall make you free. It's the same word for reality. You shall know reality, and reality sets you free. But a lot of times we don't realize that we're just going by our perception. We've set a lot of things up around us, a lot of straw men. we got a house of cards sometimes around us, and we're living in this pretense, and we don't even know it. Are you glad you came to church this morning? And so, you know, God is just saying, I believe today, come on, man, like, be a partaker, be a, be a haver, go, go get what I've already given you. Believe the songs that you sing, believe the sermons that you preach. Come on, be the body of Christ in this hour, be my people. Be my church, act like I'm real. A lot of Christians don't, can't ever find a good church because they never act like God's real. Hello? <laughs> We're always going, we're going somewhere to get together so we have a certain kind of music, certain kind of preaching or something so, so we can feel that God is real. But man, I'm telling you what, I felt that God was real. The day I got saved, I, I've never lost that feeling. It's a loving feeling. It's a powerful feeling. It's an amazing feeling. I've never forgotten that feeling. I, I have not lost God. And see, it's a psychological fact that if you don't allow yourself to feel if you don't make yourself enjoy and engage and feel some things, you'll lose the feeling. The worst thing a believer should ever do is just keep coming to church just to be coming. Just be a Christian just to be a Christian. You're not a Christian just to be a Christian. We're a Christian because Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. God, the creator, Yahweh, is the one true living God, the only God. Man, what a privilege to even know him. I cannot believe that I'm saved, that, that, that he's chose me, he found me, he sought me out. You know, I, I'm so thankful. So if I come to church and nothing seems like it's happening, man, I just start happening. I sometimes just on, in the quietness of myself, I, I don't always, you know, make a display, but sometimes just in the quietness of my own heart, I make sure that my heart has the opportunity to engage with God because I don't want to ever lose that feeling. Because that feeling is what dictates the condition of my heart. So you don't realize that if you just go and do, and then you start saying, oh, we go to a good church, but you go to the church, but secretly you feel like, well, I don't really like church all that much, but it's the only, it's the best church I can find. You're dictating the condition of your heart. You're telling your heart, you're, you're deceiving yourself and don't know it. Now, I know I may be preaching the choir in this church, but the church at large, this is why we're not sure, you know, if there was going to be a rapture yesterday or not. And the signs, you know what I think about the signs? We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. The signs, man, you should pay attention to the signs. Do you know that th this heavenly city, Jerusalem, we've been talking about, it was called Mount Zion. Do you know that the word Zion meant sign? It's a sign. Every time the pilgrims are headed back to Jerusalem, when they see Mount Zion, they're like, there's the sign. God is real. This is the city of God. This is where God chose to put his name. Praise God. We're going back to meet with God. So it's not about, you know, avoiding the signs or it's not about talking negative or anything like that. It's just that, like, we should know, really. We should be people that read the Bible. We shouldn't be people that have to have somebody else come along and give us their experience all the time. We should engage, read the Bible. You should be able to tell me, hey, I read the Bible this week, Pastor Rocky, and, you know, man, I was reading across this one verse and, and uh, you know, wasn't really getting anything several verses before. I was reading all those and then all of a sudden I came across this one verse and, man, God showed me something. If you do that, see, you'll never lose a hunger and a thirst for the word. If we live like that, we'll know that, you know, the Lord, if the Lord was coming back, he would show us. He would prepare us, right? You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to be afraid of the unknown. God has done everything, gave us the word, gave us his son. God has given us everything. We do not have to live in fear. We live in the presence of God. We've got to come back to this place where we know that. So everything that I've been 
talking about over the last three weeks and talking about Mount Zion and the heavenly city Jerusalem and the fact that we've lo- kind of lost touch with that is just to remind us that we are here and present. God put us in such a time as this. God called us to be here right now. What a privilege. We are world changers. Hallelujah. Differences are being made because we're here. You're the right person at the right time to be in this place, but you must be engaged today. Fight the culture and the system that says lay back and let someone else and lay back and wait for something to happen and just stand forward today and say, God, you know, I'm not much. I don't know much, but I know you. And every day of my life, I want to try to stay engaged. If I, if I have a day, a week, a month where I'm not engaged, what do I do? Get down about it? No, I realize it. And I get right back up and say, God, forgive me. I'm getting back on my feet again. I'm re-engaging again. Now, this psalm is about that. They were going up. That's a long introduction. Sorry for that. I have to shorten the rest of the sermon. This psalm takes into consideration everything we talked about over the last couple of weeks. That there is a city of God. And man, when people see that city, they say, that, that place is beautiful. The place is wonderful. It's not just a physical view. It's a spiritual view. It does something to the believer. This psalm takes that into consideration and knows that. And then it gives us these three little verses. It says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I love that. Today, I'm telling you what, if you took a poll in the church, that would not come up as true. People are avoiding each other today at all costs. We live in such a separated out society. Only 3% of people have ever read the Bible in its entirety, 3% of Christians. Only 3 to 4% of Christians tithe or believe in giving of themselves anyway. So don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about, man. We need to re-engage. This, but this verse right here, as they were going up to Jerusalem, it says, hey, listen, remember this as you're going up. It's a great thing to get together with your brothers and sisters. It's a great thing to go up to the house of God. Why? Because when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, God is in the midst of that. There's a lot that can be said about that, and that's one of my, probably my favorite subject to preach on because I, I believe that the Lord is restoring an understanding of what the church really is. Hello. Hello. We say the word church, we don't even know as Christians today, the word church is a terrible word. Did you know that's a horrible word? (laughs) Everybody's like, it is? (laughs) Yeah, it's a terrible word. Just go do a little word study on the word church as it's translated in English. And we all say church. This is a church. I have a church. We go to church. Some of you have heard this uh, sermon probably uh, as I preach it on the church. But church is a bad translation. In fact, it's very questionable why somebody even put that in the Bible. It's... It, church doesn't mean, you know, church has a different kind of meaning. You know where the word church comes from? The same place the word circus comes from. Did you know that? The same word, the word circle comes from. It's the word kirk, you know, the, you'll hear in Greek sometimes, a little kirk, you know, a little, little chapel or a little, little church in the woods. That's the word, but it, it wasn't in the Greek. The word in Greek means to be called out into a public assembly together. It doesn't mean to come and just you know, be in a little niche together. It means to be living life together, to be hanging out together, to be moving together, to be gathered around God together, to be doing all sorts of things, following Jesus together. The word church comes from a pagan uh, goddess, a a false deity, Circe. That's where the word comes from. How'd that get in our Bible? See, it's because of what we don't know. It's what we don't know sometimes that's killing us. It's what we don't know that we don't know. And I'm sure the enemy has a laugh that every Sunday when we gather together, go, let's go to church. He's like, Pfft. but they don't even know what they're doing. They don't even care. They don't even want to know. That may not be you, but it's a lot of us believers today. It's been so long since a, a movement overtook us and changed our lives that we've lost all feeling. What do we need to do? Go back up to the house of the Lord. We need to go back to the city of God. We need to get that reestablished in our heart again today. That we're not living for a place in this earth. We don't live in a city here. We may live there, but we're just pilgrims passing through. We really live in the heavenly Jerusalem. Galatians chapter 4, verse 26. That is the motherland for every Christian. 
We come from another dimension, another place, and we're never supposed to lose touch with that dimension. It's from that dimension that the love of God flows, that dimension that the gifts of the Holy Spirit flow. We can't work it up on our own. We can't do it on our own. And when we boil everything down to just the man-made condition that we sometimes find ourselves in, it does not really work. We're hoping that it works out. But it doesn't work. What does work is go back to the house of God and on your way say, it's a good thing to go get together with other believers. It's a good thing to get ourselves in unity before the Lord. What are we doing for time here? You know, I had a dream back in 2003. I'm a, I'm a bit of a dreamer, and this is just the way the Lord uses me. I, uh, I operate in words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Those are the main gifts that work in my life. And so a lot of times th through dreams and Sometimes the odd vision, that's the way the Lord uh, uses me. And uh, so I've learned over the years to pay attention when I see something I don't understand. And um, so I had a dream back in 2003. I've had many dreams like this, but I had this dream. And in this dream, I was going back to my hometown. And I'd been saved and had moved away from my hometown um, after getting saved at 18 years old for many years by this time. In fact, I moved away in 1983, and this was 2003. So this is 20 years later, I have this dream, and in the dream, I'm, how many people want to hear the dream? It'll mean something to you. In the dream, I'm going down the highway, and I'm coming back into my hometown. Now, guess what the name of my hometown is? Kirksville, Missouri. That's, now, at, that, at this time, I don't know everything I just told you about the word church and all that kind of stuff. I don't know any of that. So God gives me a dream. I'm going back to my hometown, and I'm excited, you know, because I know I'm going to go back, I'm going to see friends, going to see family, stuff like that, things I do when I do go back. And as I'm driving just to the city limits, I notice just to my left, there's a new church in town. I see a new church over here on the left back inside a neighborhood. So immediately, as dreams go, I just go there because God's leading the dream. So instead of going to my home, I go to this new church. And, and as I pull up to this new church, I can see from the outside, wow, this church is like very, very modern, very interesting. It has a lot of new kind of stuff. It's old in its architecture, but it's, it's uh, got a lot of new things connected to it. And the first thing I saw is it had a drive up tithing window. And as a pastor, I was a pastor then, so as a pastor, I was like, well, that's kind of cool, you know, because we can avoid a lot of problems at church if some people would just tithe and move on, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes, and I, you know, I'm probably one of them, sometimes about the only thing we have to give at the moment is just our money. If we give anything else, we might, we might hurt somebody or mess somebody up. So I was looking at it, and I wasn't really thinking all that, but I was thinking, well, well that, makes it, that makes it easy for people because we're living in a convenient society. And so I, 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 I was driving up to the church, and I saw that first, and then the pastor's wife came out into the church grounds, and she began to tell me about this new uh, church tied up window they had. She told me all about it. And so I, as the dream goes, and I, I'm listening to her very politely, and then I just uh, go inside the church. And when I go inside the church, I run into the pastor of this church in my dream, and he begins to give me a lesson on the history of the church, and he tells me how the history, or how the church was planted, how it grew, what kind of things happened. There were some moves of God that happened over the time there, and, and, and the church went through this pastor and that pastor and this phase and that phase and all that kind of stuff. And after a while, you know, I was listening very politely, but after a while, I got kind of bored with that, and I found myself walking uh, to another part of the church, and then outside on the grounds to notice this was actually a, like a church complex, more like a mega church. And I had different buildings and everything, and so I just walked around, crossed the street, looked around. You know, it's going on in my hometown. And, and so when, I, when I, uh, I'm across the street, I hear something, and when I turn around, I see the doors of the church that I'd come from, the sanctuary part of the church, were opening, and there was an usher at the front door, uh, a lot, you know, opening the church up so people could come in. So I went back across the street, and as I did, I saw the name of the church. It was called T-A-U Tabernacle. Now, if you know anything about the word, or the letter T-A-U, it's a Hebrew letter. It's also uh, a Greek letter, but it's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. I didn't know any of this stuff at the time. It's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Did you hear me? I said, it's the last letter. This is the tabernacle that will be found on earth in the last days. And I'm starting to get the picture, you know, as, as I studied this out, I started to say, God's trying to show me something here. So... I go up to the usher at the door. You're still enjoying the dream? And he says to this to me as I come up. He's at the door, you know, like an usher would be in American church. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kind of awkward. 
He's at the door, door's open, he's standing there. As I come up to him to, to greet him, he says, hello, Mr. Veach. He says, we have a seat reserved for you in the back of the church this morning. Please come on in. And so I'm thinking right away, I said, well, that's not the right kind of usher, not the kind I'm used to. I mean, I, you know, I'm a preacher. I sit in the front of the church. You know, don't you know everything happens in the front of the church? I mean, I want to be up front. I want to be where it's going down. And so I just go on in, though. I don't, I don't pay much attention. It was a little bit slightly offensive, but I just kept moving. And I learned to do that as a believer. Just keep going. Don't let things pile up on you. Amen? Don't take note of things. Don't take things to heart. Don't take negative things to heart. Don't, don't get sideways with each other. Why? Because when you're going to the house of God, we have to keep that unity among the brethren. This is important. God's going to do his thing always if we just do three short little things here. Okay? Keep that unity. So I go into the church and I see the band starting to, to fire up and I can see people in there, you know, they're starting to lift up their hands and everything and I'm heading down this, this entryway through a foyer to, to the sanctuary and all of a sudden I found myself taking a left. I saw stairs over there that went down kind of over in the corner of the church and I went down into the basement. When I got down to the basement of the church, I could see it was an apartment in the basement. It was a living quarters. And the dream simply ended with me sitting down on the steps and enjoying the atmosphere downstairs in the last day's church. I knew that I needed to avoid all this going on upstairs and get back to the downstairs where God lays the true foundation, where God is really there working, unifying us, working with us, building his church through us. And, and when I went over this dream later, I realized that these are just simple little things that the Lord was telling me. But, you know, you start to think, man, I was born in a town like that on purpose, just maybe so God could give me this dream 20 years later. God is talking to us in this hour, guys. God is calling us out in this hour. God is saying, don't accept second best. Don't just be so used to what you've been used to that you miss what God's got coming for you. Something glorious is coming. Something grand is coming, right? It's just a matter of us stepping into it now. Say, Lord, you know, we, we're living here in the end times. We don't know how long this period of time is, but we're living here. We're going to live in this thing. We're going to do this thing. We're going to walk with you. We're going to get sidetracked in the upstairs church. And I know this, this sermon sometimes is heavy, you know, a little tough for people because, you know, it's a little bit negative. And we've been trained again in our church culture that negative is a bad thing. But, you know, you wouldn't have electricity in your house if you just got rid of all negatives. We've got to come back to the place, believers, where we can handle positive and negative. We need to handle the, 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 the message God's giving us on this extreme of the church as well as be able to handle the one God's given us on that extreme of the church and then bring them both together and stay balanced in the middle. And say, Lord, that's, I won't just run to what I prefer. See, that's what most people do today. They just run to the one they prefer. And they, they don't go, most people go completely to the extreme, so they don't think they're extreme, but they don't realize that they're not really walking in a balanced Christian lifestyle. What does all this mean today, right? I'm talking to you about things that'll help you grow. Grow into what? Grow into your calling. So that you will finish your course. You will run the race and finish the course. And when you stand before the Lord, he'll say, that's a good job. He'll say, listen, Bobby, I know you weren't perfect. I know you had challenges. I know there were roadblocks. I know you had an enemy. I know it wasn't easy. I know because you stood for me, many things came against you. But thank you for standing in there. Well done, daughter. Thank you for continuing to go forward and being willing to change and being willing to grow. Be willing to let the American preacher come over once in a while and challenge you a little bit, you know? Be willing to do whatever it is, whatever it is on any given day, week, month, year that God wants to do. We've almost lost touch with the fact that God wants to do some things that aren't always so enjoyable. How many people know God has a good vision for you and a good outcome? So the good news is this, God's bringing you somewhere great. But on the way, he's going to bring you through some things once in a while so that he can get you the way that he's designed you to be. And the Bible says he predetermined that before the foundation of the world. I just simply want to live up to the will of God in my life. How about you? Now, verse 2 says this. Again, a song of ascents. Where are they going? They're going up to Zion, but they're going more than just to Jerusalem. They're going to the heavenly Jerusalem because they're going to meet with God at the temple or the tabernacle. It said... 
Behold how good, again, verse one, and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like, we're gonna get two verses what that's like. Number one, it is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. You see, the anointing oil, something we talked about last Thursday, we we're talking about some of this. So the anointing oil is the thing that was used, the uh, ointment that was used to separate people. Whatever God's call in your life was, whatever he had for you to do, you would be separated to that. And sometimes they would just slap some grease and some oil on you. Wax you up, shine you up, right? And it can be, you know, we've, a lot of us have been anointed. Raise your hand if you've ever been anointed with oil. I mean, it can be a messy process. I've had people do all sorts of things to me with oil. It can be anything from touching you with a little bit on, dabbed on your finger to just pouring it all right over your head. And, and not asking you first if the suit you had on was one you wanted to keep. But anointing is, is like that. It's, it's dirty like that, you know what? But it's beautiful like that. But it's dirty like that. You know, if you've been anointed, you know you go away sometimes from those anointing sessions. You don't think, man, how do I get this off of me? But you're thinking, but I feel so good on the inside. Something so good happened to me on the inside. Maybe somebody gave you a word. Maybe somebody, God used them to touch your life in a certain way, whatever. But man, being anointed is so great. And the Bible here says, it's like that precious oil that was poured down over Aaron because he was anointed to stand in the office, you know, of priest. And it was poured down over him and it was meant to go down over him, go down over his beard. You know what beard represents? It represents the connection between the head and the body. It's just gravity was gonna take that oil down and it was supposed to just be able to go over the beard. Reminds me one time I, I was crying, you know, and I would wipe my tears away in church. If, if the Lord touched me, I would always get rid of my tears because I'm a guy. And so I, I might have a little cry session at church. You know, God touched me. And I'd just be like, oh, God, so good, but don't let anybody see me crying. And one day God said, why don't you just leave the tears? And I said, like, what? <laughs> he said, what, what do you, why don't you just let me have my perfect way in your life? Just let the tears run. And from that day on, when I cry, I just let them run down, man. I let them dry up. I let the salt go down. I sometimes taste my own tears, whatever. I'm just like, God, you could do anything you want in my life. I'm not gonna wipe away the tears. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna wipe away the residue of God. I wanna let it stay. And that's what anointing oil was like that. It was meant to leave an impression. It was meant to leave a certain kind of a feeling. You are separated to something higher. You are called to something greater. And something is happening now in your life. There's Aaron, man. He's anointed by God. It runs down and it goes from the head, down his beard, to the body, all the way down his clothes. And I mean, there's a lot of oil here. It goes all the way down and drips off the fringe of his garment. We know from the Old Testament, we know from the, from the uh, ministry of Jesus that the borders of a garment were meant for healing. And God is like, just let me have my way all the way. Come together, meet with me in the city of God. Amen. Let me build my tabernacle in this end time. Let me restore the tabernacle of David in this end time. Let me use you. I've chosen you. I've called you. Let me anoint you in this hour and separate you to what I'm fully calling you to do. And then verse three, it's also like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The, the, the unity factor in the church Christians knowing that when we get together, God's with us. It's also like Mount Hermon in Israel. Raise your hand here if you've ever been to Israel. Okay, so you, you would know Mount Hermon's like the biggest mountain in that area over there. Now, Mount Hermon's also very interesting. It's the place Jesus took his disciples in Matthew 16. He took, took them to Caesarea Philippi, right? Remember that? And he took them to the base of that mountain and he asked them some questions. Who do people say I, the son of man, am? And they told him, you know, some people think you're a prophet. Some people think you're John the Baptist can return from the dead. They think you're all these things. And he said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And then, of course, Peter came out with the answer. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that's exactly the message I'm looking for. I'm not looking for man-made ideas. I'm looking for when God gives a message to a person. What God's saying and how he's moving through and using people to say that. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build what? My church. Actually, he said, my assembly. My called out ones into a public forum. Upon this rock, upon knowing God. See, Mount Hermon was a place from the beginning of the world of pagan activity where the angels came down or the sons of God came down. 
fallen angels came down and taught men to do things according to the book of Enoch that they weren't, you know, really supposed to know how to do. And then, you know, eventually had relations with women, with daughters of men. Remember all that? And from Mount Hermon is where all that stuff flowed. So Jesus took them right to the base of that and said, we're going to let something else flow now, starting here. We're going we're gonna to introduce another revelation, the revelation. We're going to introduce God back into the world. And he brought his disciples there and he taught them that. And notice this, the Bible says, though the dew of Hermon, is, there was a lot of snow and there is a lot of snow on that mountain. The dew of Hermon is significant. And in studying, I wanted to know why is it significant? And this is what I found. The atmosphere, the climate on Mount Hermon dictated the climate in Jerusalem because of the weather patterns or whatever. So whatever, whatever was happening on the climate of Mount Hermon dictated the atmosphere in Jerusalem. And so he says the anointer, the, the unity is like this. It's like that anointing oil and it's like that dew on Hermon. It's like that ability that the, the weather patterns from Hermon have to come down and move through the land and affect what's going on in Jerusalem. That's why Jesus took his disciples there. He said this is going to be what affects Jerusalem. This is going to be what goes out from Jerusalem into the uttermost parts of the earth and affects the whole world. My gospel, the truth about who I am is going to go forward and it's going to set people free all over the earth. Hallelujah. The air in our meeting here should be always affected by the climate in heaven. Anytime we come here, we should say, Lord, it's such a joy, it's such a pleasure to come to meet with you because we know that what you're doing there is going to become what we're doing here. There's an old Jewish saying in this scripture that I've been giving you in Galatians chapter 4 that says, you know, heavenly Jerusalem is the mother of us all. That was just a Jewish idiom, really. It was an old Jewish traditional saying for, um, or it was a way of saying uh, an idiom that they had. They used to say, as above, so below. How many people have ever heard as above, so below? Somebody mentioned Dagon here earlier, and we're going to pull Dagon down. That was you, Brother Dave, right? Let me tell you, Dagon is trying to ascend in the world today, right? The fish god, you know, the god of fishy things going on in the demonic world, trying to set another atmosphere in the world, you know? If you want to pull Dagon down, start with the mermaids at home. Hello? <laughs> get them off your kids' clothes, get them out of your house, okay? And be serious about getting rid of Dagon. I mean, you gotta realize, now where's this climate coming from? And so, so all these things started up on Mount Hermon and God says there's gonna be something different, man. I want the climate of heaven to dictate the atmosphere my people walk in. Hallelujah. And, and, and so this is, this is, you know, God is saying this today. This is, this is what he wants to do. He wants to reestablish his atmosphere. But the way that he does it is through us saying, okay, we want that. We want that. In order to grab that, we may have to get rid of some other things. We may have to let go of second best, like I said before, so we can have God's best. You know, right now the Feast of Tabernacles is going on. I, I think, are, are we in the Day of Atonement between leading up to the Feast of Tabernacles? But it's going on right now. Do you know the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the feasts they went to when they sang this song? Do you know it was the greatest celebration ever known to man? Jewish people said it was the greatest celebration ever known to man. But why was it that? Because they had this mentality of whatever God's doing in heaven, that's what's happening in Jerusalem. That's what's coming down to earth. See, the world and pagan deities and people that are into things like Masons and Illuminati and people like that, they use this same exact saying, as above, so below. Because they believe that their atmosphere will be dictated by the gods they serve. It's time for Christians to stand up and say, hey, God's going to dictate the atmosphere in our church, in our family, in our world. When I first came here a couple weeks ago, I could sense that some people were stuck here. You had some sticking issues in your life. I want you to know today, God will set you free right now. In the name of Jesus, God will begin to help you deal with the strongholds in your life. But you've got to say, I want that. I engage with that. It's got to go beyond more than just a, a mental ascent or saying, yes, I came to church today. It's got to be, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to fulfill the call of God upon my life. I want to walk in your will. I, I, I want to step over into that spirit realm. I want it to be as above, so below in my life. That's why Jesus said this in the Lord's Prayer. Let it be. Pray and say, God, you're holy, you're great, you're to be worshipped, you're to be honored, and let it be here on earth as it is in heaven. That's how we're supposed to. That's the attitude we're supposed to have in our life. It's time that we rose up as believers today. 
We're not going to let Hollywood dictate or governments dictate and politicians dictate that have given their self over to so many of these other things and it's become so obvious and evident today. It's time for the church to say Jesus is going to have his way. He may use all that. He may deal with through and around all that, but he's going to have his way. How many people think that's a great idea? Come on, guys. Let's pray this morning. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for having your way in this church. Lord, and if these people are like me, and I know they are, God, there are days when I, I'm saying that, but it feels so hollow. There are days I say, God, have your way, but I'm like, God, I don't know if I really want you to have your way. So I don't know what it's going to mean to me. So we need your help. I'm praying for your help this morning. I come to this church, Father. We're praying for the Spirit of God to come and reset the atmosphere here. The Spirit of God to come and blow in this place. Come and reset the unity factor here, Lord God. Come and separate. Come and anoint. Come and rest upon. Come and inflame. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we seek your face and we seek your help. Now, if you pray in the Spirit, why don't you just pray with me? Shakara Bahaya. Let's just seek God for a minute. Moshikara hai in the rebedio rabasida. Yerabashida man on the rebeshik de levariata rabasur. Iparamandure beshida rabakahara basib. God showed me two things for this church. I want to give them to you. The first one I think is not only for you guys, but it's for all of us in the church worldwide. God said, This is a day to prepare your house. If somebody's coming to visit you, what's the first thing you do? We go and prepare our house. We clean it up. We tidy it up. We go, we pick up anything that's messy. We straighten up. We might vacuum. We might, you know, clean the counters, put the dishes away. I believe this is an hour and this is what one thing God is saying. He's saying, prepare your house. Prepare your house for me. See, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get everything in order. We just have to take one step at a time with the Lord. Preparing your house means, okay, make sure that everything's right between you and the Lord. Let the Lord begin to minister to your heart about some of the things that aren't right with Him. Open yourself up to God. Say, Lord, I belong to you, just like the song said. And so, Lord, have your way in my life. Come and do a work in my heart. Prepare your house. Straighten up your house. Before we go after anything, before we set an agenda and say, this is the way we're going to do a thing, or this is what we're looking for, God says, just, just prepare your house for me. Let your house just be a house of prayer. Most of us will not be full-blown intercessors. God isn't saying spend all day praying. God is just saying begin to acclimate yourself towards me again. Incline your ear towards me. Prepare your house. God said I will begin to move in and fill that space. Make room. I will make a way, says God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, Lord, move into this church. We prepare, Father God, this church for you. We prepare, God, our hearts in this place. Lord, we are the church. We prepare ourselves for you. Second thing I heard the Lord say to me this week as I was in prayer. He began to show me a picture of a motorcycle. I'm a motorcycle rider, so he was speaking my language. But he began to show me, you know, a lot of times motorcycle guys, we want to add things to our bikes all the time. We want to buy a gadget and stick it on there. But the Lord showed me in prayer this week, he started showing me how many real biker or bikey type guys like you, they actually strip their bike down. The more serious they become about being in that culture, the more they strip their bike down. And I felt like the Lord was saying, this is the kind of church that I'm building in this hour. 
tell my people this is the kind of bike that I'm going to put them on. It's a bike that's stripped down, down to the essentials, down to the bare bones of the anointing, streamlined. Less is better. This kind of a mentality. I'm going to raise up a people in this day, in this hour, God said, that will be able to ride with me. Ride with me on the high places of the earth. Ride with me into the higher atmospheres of the spirit realm. I remember when I was a kid, Meatloaf, that that rock and roll guy came out and he he had an album called Bat Out of Hell and it had a stripped down bike on the album cover. And as I was in prayer, I felt like the Lord reminded me of that. And he said, man, something's coming out of heaven in this hour. Something good is coming out of heaven in this hour. Something similar, but something better is coming from the spirit realm in this hour. Hallelujah. God's going to cause us to ride again. God's going to cause us to walk with him again. God's going to restore us again. In that stripped down, listen to me, the stripped down, bare essential, book of Acts type way. Where nobody really cared about what they were making or where they were going. They just cared about following the Lord. If you do that, God says you're going to be amazed at some of the things I add to your life. For those that run with me in this hour, God says you're going to be amazed at some of the things that I add to your life. It's going to be more than you could imagine, more than you could have thought. Praise you, Lord God. I know it's getting a little late in here today, but let's just seek him just before we close. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father God, worship you in this place. Put your hands up with me this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, Lord, let that anointing fall on me. Let that anointing fall on me. Can you just begin to make that your prayer? Anointing of God, fall on me. Anointing of God, fall fresh on me. Thank you, Jesus. You see, what the Lord is saying today is it's it's all about, will you give me second best so I can give you the best? It's different for every one of us. But the Lord's speaking the same thing across the board. He said, will you give me that which is second best? Give it to me. I got something better for you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come on, let's leave a residue this morning that'll last all week. Come on, let's have a touch from God this morning that's real. That's purposeful, Lord. We want you. Praise you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord God.